It is the 11th century. The Christian armies have gathered and unified under one banner in an ample dissented scene. The goal is to retake Jerusalem and Palestine from the Muslims. The bloody brutal crusades are about to begin. In the 11th century, the world was divided into Islamic and Christian countries. The two religious worlds were burning in a state of constant war with each other until a great power emerged from the east. Those are the Seljuk Turks who were displaced from Central Asia as Turkish tribes and embraced the Sunni sect of Islam. They expanded the great Sultanate until they reached Anatolia. Most of Asia Minor became under Seljuk control. In the year 1092, the great Seljuk Sultan Malik Shah had died and his state was divided into states fighting each other. Despite this, the Byzantine Emperor Alexius Komnenos was unable to recover what he had lost to the Seljuks. The Byzantine capital Constantinople was exposed at any moment to attack, so the Byzantine Emperor wrote to the Pope of Rome asking for military support and the hope of recovering the historical cities with the Christian heritage that fell into the hands of Muslims. The Pope had several reasons to help the Byzantines, the most important of which was to restore the lost bond between Christians in Eastern and Western Europe since the great schism between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. He wanted to reunite the Church under the papal authority as Archbishop of the world. In Clermont, at France, Pope Urban called on the clergy and nobles and in a spiritual influential sermon, he incited the Christians of the West to help their brothers in the East in order to liberate Jerusalem from the Islamic rule and promised them to atone for their sins if their mission to liberate Jerusalem was successful, enthusiastically saying in one voice, Deus Volt, Deus Volt. The impact of the Pope's sermon was strong on the Christians, who left their differences aside and united under one banner of this holy campaign, heading to the east to reclaim the Holy Land against a scattered and divided Islamic world. The Pope was able to ignite the enthusiasm in the Christians in an incredible way, affected emotionally by the powerful words of the Pope. Some destitute poor men found in this crusade an escape from their bitter reality and organized a campaign and march to the east. Unauthorized by the Pope, they committed massacres against the Jews in the Rhine Basin and other German cities. When this campaign reached the Kingdom of Hungary, fighting broke out between the Crusaders and the Bulgarian armies. After the Crusades had looted the Bulgarian markets and the countryside on the way to the Byzantine capital, the Byzantine Emperor did not want to bother himself with this disorganized campaign, so he quickly got rid of them and let them cross the Bosphorus and enter Anatolia. As soon as they touched land in Asia, they began plundering the cities. They reached the Gulf of Nicomedia, where a dispute arose between the German and Italian leaders on one side and the French on the other. Peter the Hermit lost control of his armies which began to scramble to occupy and loot the cities without strategic planning. The Germans took the city of Xerigodin, while the French force headed to Nicaea to take it. While they were heading to Nicaea, the Seljuk army led by the Seljuk Sultan Kilj Aslan prepared an ambush in the force of the city. When the crusaders were passing unsuspectingly, the Seljuks attacked them like lightning. A state of panic occurred in the ranks of the Crusaders, and chaos broke out as they began to escape in an attempt to survive this sudden ambush. But the light Seljuk cavalry reached out to the Crusaders and inflicted annihilation on the Crusader army with the survival of a small number of soldiers of the campaign. Among them was Peter the Hermit, who was destined to join the upcoming organized Crusader armies. After that, the Seljuks managed to recapture the city of Xerigodin from the Germans and Kilj Aslan defeated the remaining army in Anatolia. The random crusade had failed. It was known as the People's Campaign, which marched before the first organized crusade called by Pope Urban. The common crusader army, 
knew that they had to be careful and its mission would never be easy. The Prince's Crusader army included the most important leaders of Europe, including Godfrey de Bouillon, his brother Prince Baldwin, Prince Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, Prince Robert Curtis, Duke of Normandy, and the ambitious Prince Bohemond, son of Robert Giscard, the commander of the army coming from southern Italy. With his nephew, Prince Tancred, Bishop Ademar was appointed as a spiritual leader. The armies arrived to Constantinople one after another. Each had his reasons, motives and ambitions, and it was clear that the world would witness a historical event that no one had ever seen before. Alexius could not have imagined that his call would be so welcome. He received the army of 60,000 soldiers graciously. He took the oath from them to claim all the lands he had before the soldiers, including Antioch. In the spring of the year 1097, the crusaders set out in Asia and the leaders agreed to take Nikaya, the capital of the Seljuk of Rome. The crusaders wanted to take advantage of the absence of the Seljuk Sultan, Pilj Aslan, who was busy fighting his Turkish enemies in the east. The huge crusader arms flooded around the fortified city of Nikaya, and the siege began on May 6, 1097. The siege was only from the land side, meaning the city continued to receive supplies from the seaside. The Byzantine Emperor has participated in the siege with only one contingent of cavalry, letting the city to be supplied from the sea. This was, however, a clever act from him, as he wanted to prove a point for the crusaders. They needed him more than he needed them. The news reached the Seljuk Sultan in Malatya that his capital was being invaded by the crusaders. He rushed in an attempt to save it. The city withstood the crusader siege. The catapults could not make any impact on the fortified walls of the city. The Byzantine Emperor feared that the city would be subjected to looting and sabotage if it fell to the crusaders. He feared that the crusaders would not commit to handing him the city over if they are able to take it. So he began negotiations with the Muslim garrison to hand him the city over. He promised them to preserve the blood of the Muslims and not to plunder the country and to protect it from the crusaders. While the Muslim garrison thought about the matter, Kilj Aslan arrived with his army on 21st of May and upon his arrival, he immediately clashed with the crusader armies to open a way into the city. But his attempt to break the siege had failed. He was surprised by the strength of the crusader forces that forced him to leave the city to its fate. Then, Alexius moved his fleet and prevented supplies from reaching the city. The city's inhabitants realized that a disaster was imminent and quickly accepted the emperor's offer. Byzantine flags rose on the city walls, leaving the crusaders in amazement at what happened and the Byzantine soldier told them that the city has been taken by the Byzantines. Alexius had to pay the crusaders precious gifts in exchange for keeping the city for himself and refusing to let them in. To be fair to the emperor, he kept his word and preserved the blood of Muslims. He even returned the wife of the sultan, his sister and his two sons back with nothing in return. The fall of Nikaya occurred in June 1097, after 16 years of Muslim rule. After the fall of the capital, and his knowledge of the huge numbers of the crusaders, Kilj Aslan made a truce with the Danishman the prince, concluding an alliance and agreeing to confront the crusader danger. Kilj Aslan quickly headed towards Konya and made it his capital. The crusaders decided to divide their armies into two divisions, a vanguard led by Bohemond and Robert and a rearguard led by Godfrey and Raymond to facilitate the supply process and eliminate the Seljuks as much as possible. On the 13th of June, the vanguard reached the plains of Dorelium and camped there. On the 13th of June, the vanguard reached the plains of Dorelium and camped there. On the morning of the next day, the Turks appeared out of nowhere and began to encircle the crusaders. They put pressure on them. Bohemond showed ingenuity in organizing his army and was able to repel the Seljuks. He then launched an attack with his heavy cavalry on the Turkish light cavalry. Despite the heavy armor, the crusaders incurred huge casualties. The arrows of Muslims fell upon them from every side. 
and many of them were killed until the defenses almost vanished. Before a unit of Godfrey's army arrived to relieve the pressure on the besieged Crusader army, but the battle was far from over. And with the arrival of another unit from the rear guard of the Crusader army, the left wing of the Muslims was besieged, and the Seljuks were defeated in this battle. Then the Crusaders entered the city of Dorelium. This battle had a prominent role in weakening the Seljuk Sultanate and declining its prestige. The losses were estimated to be around 3,000 for the Turks, compared to 4,000 for the Crusaders. The two teams showed great dedication and discipline. The Seljuks showed advanced tactical flexibility, while the Crusaders showed steadfastness and tremendous endurance. The Seljuk Sultan knew that he was not able anymore to confront this great force, so he allowed the Crusader armies to pass in Anatolia. Then the Crusaders took Konya and Heraclius, and finally took Tarsus. The cities of Asia Minor are once again under Byzantine's rule after being in the hands of the Muslim for about 20 years. The next target is the city of Antioch before continuing the march towards the Holy Land. Having established themselves at Tarsus, the Crusader army took the safe route by going around the Tarsus mountains with the exception of two brigades that marched through the rugged mountains and were under the command of Tancred and Baldwin. Then Tancred met with the original Crusader army while Baldwin accepted the invitation of the Armenians in Edessa to surrender the city, fearing that it would be occupied by the Seljuk army of Mosul. And there he founded the first Crusader state, the state of Edessa. The Crusaders continued their way and reached Antioch, the last stronghold of the Turks in the region, before entering the Levant in October 1097. The approach of the Crusaders to the city caused a great panic among the population. Antioch is a historical city and one of the most fortified cities with giant walls that iron, stone and fire are unable to destroy. Therefore, its population withstood and after more than two months of the siege, an Islamic relief force came from Damascus, commanded by the Seljuk Emir Dukak and another force from Homs commanded by Hussein ibn Malad. The two Muslim armies met with the Crusader army in the south of Antioch at the end of December 1097, where a battle took place in which the Muslims had the upper hand, even though they did not achieve a decisive victory. Nevertheless, Dukak decided to withdraw and return to Damascus to secure his city and did not try to save Antioch again. When the siege took longer than anticipated, the Crusaders despaired, and famine almost killed them, despite receiving Byzantine aid from Cyprus. Nine months into the siege, a betrayal occurred among the Muslims, telling the enemies about the weaknesses in the city walls, so the Crusaders invaded it, shed blood, and committed brutal murders by killing innocent civilians. Antioch fell. Its fall caused a reaction from the army of Mosul, Kerboga who headed with his army towards Edessa and besieged the Crusaders for three weeks, then lifted the siege and headed to Antioch in an attempt to save it. He arrived six days after its fall and besieged it on 8th of June 1098 until the Crusaders were forced to eat the leaves of the trees. But Bahamut's cunning was the decisive factor in this battle. He spread a story among his soldiers that the spear with which Jesus peace be upon him was stabbed is located in Antioch. This was confirmed by a vision of one of the monks indicating the location of the Holy Spear. So they dug and extracted it from the ground. This act lifted the morale of the desperate crusaders who then fought the Muslims until they defeated them in a crushing defeat on 28th of June 1098. Bohemond then established the second crusader state in the region, the state of Antioch. After the fall of Antioch, an epidemic spread in the camp of the Crusaders and killed thousands of them. Among them was Bishop Ademar, the representative of the Pope and the head of the campaign. To avoid the epidemic, the soldiers spread and launched raids outside Antioch and headed to a city called Marat Norman, 
who had to surrender after some resistance, but the Crusaders did not respect the treaty they had given to its population. They entered the city, raised crosses over the country, and plundered it. The murder was brutal and criminal. The number of the dead was estimated at 20,000 men, women, and children, and according to the estimates of the Muslim historian Ibn al-Athir, the number of the dead reached more than 100,000. After 40 days of destruction and crimes in Ma'arat and Norman, the Crusaders returned to Antioch, where differences emerged between the leaders of the campaign who quarreled over the fate of Antioch and the hidden intentions were revealed. All of Raymond's efforts to persuade Bohemond to march to Jerusalem had failed. The soldiers had enough and revolted against their leaders and forced them to march to the Holy Land, which was the main objective of the campaign. They left Antioch in mid-January 1099 and were led by Raymond and Godfrey, while Bohemond remained in his newly established estate. This is how things went in the north, but what about the Fatimids in the south? The Crusader invasion weakened the Seljuk Sultanate and showed the weakness of its rulers. The Fatimids took advantage of these weaknesses and prepared an army and marched from Egypt, commanded by the general Al-Aftal ibn Badr al-Jamali. He entered with the Seljuks in a battle that lasted for 40 days until the Seljuks surrendered and left Jerusalem, leaving it to the Fatimids in 1098. When the news reached the Fatimids that the Seljuks have been defeated by the Crusaders in Antioch, they tried to communicate with them in order to conclude an alliance against the Seljuks. They sent ambassadors to Antioch and expressed their willingness to recognize their rule in the north of the Levant on a condition that the Fatimids keep Jerusalem while allowing the Crusaders to visit its holy places. They also offered to cooperate with them to fight the Seljuks. However, the response from the Crusaders was firm, no truces or agreements, but only swords and beheadings. The war is coming, and the Crusaders will not retreat until they take Jerusalem. The Crusaders marched south towards their goal and conquered the Levantine cities one by one without facing any resistance. The local princes paid the bribes to the Crusader leaders so that their country would not be violated. The Muslim garrison in Jerusalem was led by the Fatimid ruler himself, Iftikhar al-Dawla, who took the necessary precautions before the arrival of the Crusaders, poisoning all the nearby wells, preventing the invaders from benefiting from its water. He also expelled the Christians from the city, fearing that they would sympathize with the people of the faith and Muslims would be vulnerable to betrayal. The plan was to prolong the siege as much as they could until the arrival of a relief force from Egypt. Three and a half years after Pope Urban's sermon in Clermont, on the evening of the 7th of June, the Crusader army reached the walls of Jerusalem and encamped around it. The numbers of the Crusaders were not enough to put a complete siege on a city the size of Jerusalem. They distributed their soldiers as follows. Robert of Normandy along the northern wall, Godfrey and Tancred taking their positions on the western side, and Raymond and his soldiers positioned on the south, while the eastern and southeastern sides were left unguarded. The tactics of Fatimid Rula proved highly effective, as the Crusaders had to travel long miles to secure supplies, considering the wells surrounding Jerusalem were poisoned. Moreover, the Muslim knights would come out every now and then and harass the exhausted crusaders from the non-besieged side of the city. Rumors spread in the crusader camp that a rescue force had left Egypt and they should attack and seize the city before the arrival of the relief force. At the dawn of the sixth day of the siege, the crusaders began to bombard the walls of the holy city and orders were given to the forces to launch a full-scale attack. The Crusaders, full of passion, attacked the walls. They were repelled from all sides except for the northern region, which achieved a remarkable superiority and defeated the Fatimid army from the outer wall to the inner wall. The Crusaders' lack of the necessary siege tools prevented the completion of this attack, and Muslims were able to repel the attackers out of the city, inflicting heavy casualties on them. After this unsuccessful attack, the Christian leaders waited 
Juna Namisli agreed to prepare all the equipment they needed before attacking with all force they could when their equipment becomes completed. They lacked ladders, catapults and destruction machines and began to gather wood from areas where trees were abundant. At this time, ships came to the Levant and sat in Jaffa bringing supplies, food and weapons in addition to large quantities of nails, ropes and locks. Their carpenters and blacksmiths were able to build stairs and catapults and one of the most important things they made were two large wooden towers overlooking the wall. Raymond used a tower in the south and Tank reduced a tower in the north. The morale of the crusaders has been collapsing after the long period of the siege. They did not expect such fierce resistance and such valiant steadfastness from the Muslims. Therefore, morale had to be raised. On the 8th of July, they declared a complete fast and pilgrimage to the Mount of Olives, where their clergymen gave sermons that inflamed the enthusiasm of the soldiers and stirred their emotions. They made force to work together in order to liberate Jerusalem. Then one of the monks claimed that he saw Bishop Adama in his dream, giving them the secret key to victory, and that there was no victory over the infidels, according to their claim, until after the entire army roamed around the city before carrying out the attack. Indeed, these tactics succeeded in raising the morale of the soldiers. On the night of the 14th of July, it was decided to start the attack from the south and north. The attackers could not break through the fortified walls and their attack was not effective enough. Due to the fortification and defensive tactics prepared by Muslims, the first day ended without any significant change. The next morning, the attack resumed. Godfrey advanced with his huge tower, covered with the skins of flayed animals to protect it from the Greek fire used by Muslims. After a long fight, Godfrey reached the edge of the wall with his giant tower and the Christians powered into the city walls. While resistance continued in the southern front, led by the Fatimid ruler of Tikhar al-Dawla, where defenders managed to burn the wooden tower of Raymond. With the collapse of the northern front, the Muslim soldiers fled in front of the crusaders. The crusader victory rang out, blood was shed, and all kinds of criminality and brutality emerged from the crusader soldiers, who abused and massacred everyone whom their eyes came across, not differentiating between a child or a woman a Muslim or a Jew, until the city was flooded with blood and body parts and heads were spread everywhere. Severe ribs were scattered in every direction and heads, hands and feet were piled up in the streets. Every crusade soldier was seen covered in blood from head to toe. Resorting to Al-Aqsa Mosque and places of worship did not prevent the crusaders from practicing their crimes. They stormed the mosque and continued to kill and abuse tens of thousands of civilians. It was said that only a few Muslims survived this terrible massacre, which was one of the most horrific and barbaric ones, even by standards of that time. Iftikhar al-Dawla and his remaining soldiers sought refuge in David's fortress until they were given safety to leave. So they resorted to Ascalon, and thus the holy city fell on 15th of July, 1099 after a siege that lasted 39 days. Four years after its launch, the crusade achieved its desired goal and Jerusalem fell after a series of brutal and barbaric massacres. The crusaders in the Levant established four states, the state of Edessa, the state of Antioch, the state of Tripoli, and the kingdom of Jerusalem. But the war is not over yet. A Fatimid army is marching from Egypt and is determined to restore Jerusalem. So what happened in the Battle of Ascalon? The fall of Jerusalem caused a great dispute between the Crusader leaders over the ownership of the city, and two candidates emerged, Godfrey and Raymond. Without spending so much time talking about this dispute, leadership eventually passed to Godfrey, while Raymond and Robert left for Jericho. The Fatimids were not satisfied with the fall of the Holy City, so they prepared an army of several races including Arabs, Seljuks, Kurds, Persians, Ethiopians and Armenians, forming an army of 20,000 soldiers. On the other hand, the Crusaders distributed their spies all over the region until they were able one day 
to capture two Egyptian scouts who gave secret and important information about the preparation and tactics of the Egyptian Fatimids. Upon learning about the strength of the Fatimid army, Godfrey wrote to Raymond and Robert in Jericho and called them to forget their differences and come to protect the Crusader army from perishing. After much hesitation, Raymond responded to Godfrey's request and together, accompanied by Patriarch Arnulf of Chalks, they set out an army of 10,000 soldiers and marched to Ascalon. The Fatimids did not know that their plans had been revealed and they thought that the Crusaders were still in Jerusalem and the plans was for the Muslim army to march and besiege their enemies in Jerusalem. But at the dawn of August 12, the Crusader army reached Ascalon with Godfrey on the left, Raymond on the right and Tancred in the middle. The infantry lined up in the front row in front of the heavy cavalry. Surprisingly, the Crusader army launched a surprise attack on the Fatimid army which was still sleeping in its camp outside the walls of Ascalon. After a long struggle to form their ranks, the Fatimid infantry was finally able to line up for battle after losing a large number of men, while the cavalry could not engage in the battle because they were not ready in time. The Fatimids resisted for a while and their contingent of infantry managed to break through the ranks of the Crusaders, but this did not last long. Within one hour, the Crusaders reached the Muslim camp and seized the vizier's tent and his personal belongings, including his sword. The battle was in the process of ending with the complete collapse of the Fatimid army. The remaining of the survivors entered the Ascalon. The historian from Damascus, Ibn al-Qalani, estimated the losses of the Fatimids in the battle at 12,700 dead, compared to minor losses in the ranks of the Crusaders. The victory of the Crusader forces in the Battle of Ascalon tempted Godfrey to besiege the city in order to occupy it. After the first Muslim attempts to recapture Jerusalem had failed and ended in complete defeat, the people of Ascalon were ready to surrender the city to Raymond exclusively because he was the only one who showed mercy to Muslims on the day of the fall of Jerusalem. Godfrey feared that Raymond would turn from an ally to an opponent in an area adjacent to Jerusalem, he refused and insisted on entering the city by the sword. Indeed, the Christians attacked Ascalon and harassed it, so its inhabitants had to stand up to defend it and resist the invaders fiercely and bravely. This fierce resistance resulted in more than 2,700 martyrs among the people of Ascalon. Not being able to defeat the brave people of Ascalon, the Crusaders were forced to lift the siege on the condition that the Fatimids in Ascalon pay a tax of 20,000 dinars annually. Therefore, the Fatimid garrison in Ascalon remained a thorn in the waist of the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem and did not fall until the year 1153, where it will be soon liberated by the leader, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. The Battle of Ascalon was the last battle of the First Crusade, which culminated in a resounding success for the Crusaders. The echoes of this victory spread throughout Europe. Christians gathered from everywhere to come to Palestine to protect the Holy Land. And with the end of this video, the series of the First Crusade ends. And do not forget to share, like and subscribe to Mining History channel.